Now that we've seen the dot product, let's talk about the cross product. So I wanna pull up this slide that I had when we started our dot product lecture because the cross product is going to be another operation on vectors. Compared with the dot product there, we have some different properties about the cross product. So one important fact to remember is that the cross product is only valid in three dimensional space. So we only take the cross product when we're working with vectors in R3. The result is another vector in R3. So the cross product of two vectors u and v will produce a third vector. We'll use the cross product in a lot of different situations in this course, but one application in physics is the notion of torque. So we'll visit that in a future lecture. Okay, so what is the cross product? Well, we're gonna have an algebraic approach, which we're about to do, and a geometric approach. So before I explain to you what the cross product creates, what the point of taking a cross product is, let's just go through the algebra of how to actually compute it. So I think the best way to learn this is just with an example. Let's compute the cross product of the vector 1, 0, negative 1, and 2, 3, negative 1. So we'll cross these two vectors in this order. Especially compared with the dot product, the cross product is a big calculation. There's no real shortcut way to do this. I'll show you a few different ways to do this. I'll start with my favorite way, then we'll talk about the rule of Saris, and then I'll just write down a formula that some students memorize. But again, it's a big calculation. You just have to figure out how you like to do it and then master it so that whenever you see that you need to take a cross product, you don't spend too much time agonizing over that fact. You just go ahead and take the cross product. So here's how I do it. What I do is I'm going to create something that looks kind of like a three by three matrix. It's a little bit strange because my first row is actually going to be the symbols I, J, and K. The second row of this three by three array I'm creating is the entries in the first vector that we're crossing. So that's going to be one, zero, and negative one. And then the third row is the other vector, two, three, and negative one. Okay, and then I'm going to draw this in kind of vertical bars like that. Okay, now what we're gonna do is take essentially a three by three determinant. If you know how to take a three by three determinant, that's great, you have a little bit of a head start. If you haven't seen that before, it's okay. I'm teaching you how to take the cross product right now. So this is the algorithm that you need to learn. The first entry in the vector that comes out of the cross product is going to be the ith entry. So here we know that we're working on the ith entry. And then I look in the lower right corner to that two by two sub matrix and I compute its determinant, which is gonna be zero times negative one minus three times negative one. So that's zero times negative one minus three times negative one. So it's main diagonal product minus the other diagonal. And then all of that is the first entry in our, our vector that we're computing. So I'll put I there to denote that that's the first component. Okay, for the second component, I'm gonna cross off the row and column that have the J in it because we're gonna be computing the J component of our, our vector. We're left with a two by two submatrix, so one, negative one, two, negative one. And then we do the two by two determinant of the entries we're left with. So the one, negative one, two, negative one, two by two submatrix, we're gonna do one times negative one minus two times negative one but for this middle term, we pick up a negative sign. And then lastly, for the third entry, we're gonna cross off the row and column that contain the K vector, that third standard basis vector, and do this little two by two subdeterminant, but in the usual way. So we're not gonna pick up a negative sign. We'll have one times three minus two times zero. Okay, so now let's simplify. So let's see that first entry is gonna be zero plus three, so that's three i, and then negative one plus two is one, but there's a negative sign there, so minus one j, and then three minus zero, so plus three k. Or alternatively, with angular brackets, we could say that the cross product of these two vectors is the vector three, negative one, three. I would have computed this a lot faster if I were just doing this on my own. So if you practice this enough, it should become routine. 
This is how I usually compute cross products. So in any future video after this lecture, if I'm taking a cross product and you're watching me do it, I am almost certainly going to be using this method. But I do want to show you the rule of Saras. I don't think that the rule of Saras is faster or a shortcut or anything like that. There is no real quick way to do a cross product. This is just another way to organize the calculation, which I think helps some people who might have a tendency to, to mess up because of a negative sign. So here what you do is you start off by writing the same three by three array that we had on the previous slide. So my first row is i, j, k. My second row is the components of the first vector, one, zero, negative one. And my third row is the components of the second vector. So two, three, negative one. And then what I'm gonna do is actually duplicate the first two columns to the right. So I'll have i, one, two, j, zero, three. Then under this organization, the cross product of these two vectors is equivalent to adding together the products of these three diagonals and then subtracting off the products of these three diagonals. So let me show you what I mean. So for the first three diagonals that I highlighted, we're gonna have zero times negative one i plus negative one times two j plus one times three k. So that takes care of the first three diagonals. And then for the, the backwards going diagonals, we're just gonna subtract those. So the first one is this one, that's actually gonna give us a k vector, so I'll write it on the right. We're gonna have minus two times zero k, and then we have an i vector, so that's gonna be minus negative one times three i. I'll do minus three times negative one i. And then minus negative one times one j. Okay, so we have zero i plus three i, so that's gonna be three i, and then negative two j, uh, minus negative j, so negative two j plus j is negative one j, and then three k minus zero k is three k. So same as before, we get the vector three, negative one, three, of course that's what you should hope for because had we reached a contradiction, that would have been really bad. Okay, so this is an alternative way to do the cross product computation, which uh, I think the hard part is really writing the columns. So it's just a three by five grid to write out. But then the product formation is pretty nice, the way you kind of can line them up with i, j, and k in this order. So those are two ways to compute the cross product. Let me just write down a formula that some students prefer to memorize, but I think it's a little bit risky. So alternatively, if I want to cross two vectors, say vector A has components A1, A2, A3, I cross that one with the vector B, which has components B1, B2, B3. Then the result is A2, B3 minus A3, B2, A3, B1 minus A1, B3, that's in the second component, and then the third component is a1, b2, minus a2, b1. So if you don't like these more constructional operations, you could just memorize this formula. Now that we've seen how to compute the cross product of two vectors, let's go over some algebraic properties. So suppose a and b are any two vectors in R3. Is a cross b the same thing as b cross a? So you can try that on the vectors that we just looked at, and the answer is no. So a cross b is negative b cross a. Suppose we took the vector a and we scaled it by k, and then we crossed it with b. That would be the same thing as first crossing a with b. That produces a vector which you could then scale by k. Or you could do a cross kb. In other words, it doesn't matter when you do that scalar multiplication. The cross product is distributive, so that's what properties three and four tell us. So a cross the vector sum of b and c is equivalent to a cross b 
plus a cross c. And the same thing is true in reverse. So the vector sum of a plus b cross c gives you a cross c plus b cross c. And then let's look at these triple products. The first one is the scalar triple product, a dot the cross product of b and c. If it was convenient to you, you could reorder that as a cross b first, and then dot that result with c. Notice the final calculation here is a dot product, so that should return you a scalar value. On the flip side, if you took two vectors b and c and crossed them, that's gonna give you another vector in R3. What is a cross that? Well, this is a formula I've never actually memorized, but technically you could compute that as a dot c. That's a scalar. You use that scalar to scale the vector b and then minus a dot b, another scalar which scales the vector c. Okay, I've put two exercises down here using the standard basis vectors i, j, and k. So let's compute i cross j cross k. So j cross k first and then i cross that and then i cross the cross product of i and k. Okay, a few different ways you can do this and you should try them. You can just do them using the methods that we've looked at. So literally take these cross products. Let me do j cross k up in the top right corner. Okay, so the way I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna write i, j, k on the first row of a three by three array, and then zero, one, zero, that's for the first vector in the cross product j, and then zero, zero, one, that's for the second vector. And then let's see, my first entry is one times one minus zero times zero in the first component, going with the i, i vector in the first, first entry up here. And then the second component is going to be zero times one minus zero times zero with the negative sign. But anyway, it's zero, so that's zero there. And then the third component will be zero, zero minus zero times one, so that's also gonna be zero. So the cross product j cross k is actually i. Now what is i cross i? We could do this manually again, so we could do i, j, k, one, zero, zero, one, zero, zero. Our first component's gonna be zero, zero, minus zero, zero, so that's zero. Zero times one minus one times zero, so that's zero. And then zero times one minus one times zero again. So that's also zero. So overall, this first cross product was the vector zero. I cross I giving us the zero vector is actually true about any vector cross itself, and it comes out of this first property. So if A cross B is negative B cross A, that tells us that if I took a vector and crossed it with itself, suppose I replaced A and B here with the same vector U. So for the first vector U, the second vector U, now imagine I, I flip the roles. So from the left-hand side of property one, I go to the right-hand side, you're not gonna see a difference in the U's, but we're gonna pick up a negative sign. So that means that U cross itself must be zero because no non-zero number could be equal to its own negative. Okay, for the second example I put down at the bottom, I cross the cross product of I and K, let's try the vector triple product. Again, you could just do this manually, but let me try using property number six. This is going to be I dot K times I minus i dot i times k. If you compute i dot k, you're gonna get zero. So the dot product of any two different standard basis vectors gives you zero. So that's zero i minus i dot itself is one, so you can check that. So i dot i is one, likewise j dot j is one, k dot k is one. So we're gonna get minus one k. So overall that's negative k. Now that we've seen algebraically how to compute the cross product of two vectors a and b in three-dimensional space, let's talk about geometrically what the cross product does. So one of the main applications of the cross product, one of the reasons why we care about taking this operation on two vectors, is that the resulting vector, a cross b, is orthogonal to both of the original vectors a and b. Recall orthogonal means perpendicular. 
So A and A cross B have a 90 degree angle between them, as do B and A cross B. Okay, so here, imagine I've drawn these two vectors A and B, and I've tried to make this picture look like it lives in three dimensional space. So you have to imagine that these are two vectors in R3. And I've taken their cross product. The resulting vector A cross B has to be mutually perpendicular with both A and B. So if you can visualize this, you can essentially think of the A vector here as, as kind of like the X axis, the B vector like the Y axis if you're struggling to make this picture look three dimensional. And then the resulting vector is either gonna point straight up, analogous to the Z axis, or straight down. Of course, A and B themselves don't have to be mutually perpendicular. I'm just trying to make this picture look three dimensional. So which one is it? And the answer is that the cross product taking A cross B in that order obeys what we call the right hand rule in mathematics. There are a couple different ways to visualize the right hand rule. So what I do is I imagine placing the fingers of my right hand along the direction of the A vector so that my fingers are pointing in the same direction as A and curling them in the most natural way possible towards the B vector. So if my fingers are pointing along the A vector and I kind of sweep them towards the B vector without having to kind of rotate my wrists around or bend my fingers backwards, you know, some unnatural amount, then the direction my thumb is pointing is the direction of A cross B. So that's one interpretation of, of what the right hand rule is or how to, how to enact it with your right hand. The other version of the right hand rule is to make a configuration with your right hand where your index finger is pointing along A, your middle finger is pointing along B, and then your thumb is pointing in the direction of A cross B. So both of these configurations would tell you that this vector here is the one that satisfies the right hand rule. So this is A cross B. The one pointing down is actually negative A cross B. Or in other words, it's B cross A. So if you did the right hand rule backwards, if you accidentally used your left hand, you would get that vector. Now you have to be careful, I'm actually left-handed, so I always have to catch myself, wait, am I actually using my right hand when I do the right hand rule? So if you're a Southpaw like me, make sure that you really do use your right hand. You'll get the wrong answer if you use your left. As a corollary, considering how the vectors i, j, and k are situated and what their cross product result is, we have to have i cross j equal to k Computationally, if you do I cross J, you get K. But physically, if you draw a picture of the axes and you use the right hand rule, you need to draw the axes and label them X, Y, and Z in such a way that I cross J will give you K. In other words, you sweep your fingers from I to J or from the X axis to the Y axis and your thumb is pointing up in the direction of the K axis. Here I'm talking about the positive half of the axes. Similarly, you can check that J cross K computationally will give you I and via the right hand rule, the way you draw your axes in R3, it also has to give you I. And then lastly, K cross I must give you J. So the way that I've been labeling the axes in R3 is the standard way to label them. Other configurations might satisfy those rules and therefore be possible. So look at these three pictures for a minute and decide do these pictures satisfy the right hand rule? So are these valid ways to label the positive halves of the X, Y, and Z axis? Okay, this first one is the traditional way that we've been labeling it, so hopefully this is correct. So here we have the I, J, and K vectors. So again, computationally, I cross J equals K. And visually, we've labeled these axes correctly so that I cross J does equal K via the right hand rule. For the picture in the middle, we have I here, J here, and K here. So this is not standard. But if you check all of the cross products, so I cross J gives you K, J cross K gives you I, K cross I gives you J, this is also a valid way to label the, the X, Y, and Z axes. 
It's not standard, but it makes sense. On the other hand, in this third picture, if I have I pointing along the positive x-axis, J pointing along the positive y-axis, if you do the right-hand rule here, you would get this vector pointing backwards should give you K. And that's not the way I labeled these axes. So this third one is not a valid way to label the axes in R3. Okay, so here's just a practice with two random vectors u and v, so not the standard basis vectors. What is u cross v? What I really mean here is what direction does it point? And this picture, of course, is a bit ambiguous, so I think I'm imagining both of these vectors as kind of coming out in the first octant towards u. So you can picture this one as having, it looks like a positive x, y, and z component. It's kind of pointing out at u. This one is similarly pointing out at u, but maybe z is, is zero or slightly negative. So that's how I'm visualizing these. Now, if we do the right-hand rule, if I do u cross v, so I put my fingers along u and sweep them towards v in the most natural direction, so through the smaller of the two angles formed by the vectors u and v, so I don't have to kind of curl my wrist backwards, what we find is that u cross v, according to the right-hand rule, should point out this way. I actually did this algebraically and, and found that that was u cross v, so it's actually a very long vector pointing in that direction. Is there anything I can say about how long such a vector would be? So u cross v, can we, do we have any formulas about its length? And we do. So just like with dot products, we do have an angular formula with cross products. So if I take these two vectors a and b, and I call the angle between them theta. So here, of course, we're picking the smaller of the two angles between A and B. Then the length of the vector that you get when you do A cross B is actually the length of A times the length of B times sine of the angle between them. We proved the similar formula for the dot product, so I think I won't do it here for the cross product, but you can try to work out geometrically why that would be the case. Okay, so if I had two vectors and their cross product was zero, what could we say? Well, one possibility is, is either of them is zero. If you take any vector and cross it with the zero vector, you're gonna get zero. If neither vector is zero, then neither vector's magnitude is zero. So if A cross B returns a zero vector, that means sine of theta would have had to be zero. Now, when is sine of theta zero? That's if theta equals zero or pi. In other words, zero degrees or 180 degrees. And that happens when A and B are parallel. Since we think of all vectors as parallel to the zero vector by default, we can say that A cross B equals zero if and only if A and B are parallel.